Sections twenty and twenty one of How to Sing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. How to Sing by Lily Lehman. Translated by Richard Aldrich. Section twenty. The Tongue. Since it is the function of the tongue to conduct the column of breath above the larynx to the resonance chambers, too much attention cannot be given to it and its position in speaking as well as in singing. If it lies too high or too low, it may, by constricting the breath, produce serious changes in the tone, making it pinched or even shutting it off entirely as soon as it presses on the larynx. It has an extremely delicate and difficult task to perform. It must be in such a position as not to press either upon the larynx or epiglottis. Tongue and larynx must keep out of each other's way, although they always work in cooperation. But one must not hamper the other, and when one can withdraw no farther out of the way, the other must take it upon itself to do so. For this reason, the back of the tongue must be raised high, the larynx stand low. The tongue must generally form a furrow. With the lowest tones, it lies relatively flattest the tip always against and beneath the front teeth, so that it can rise in the middle. As soon as the furrow is formed, the mass of the tongue is put out of the way, since it stands high on both sides. It is almost impossible to make drawings of this. It can best be seen in the mirror. As soon as the larynx is low enough, and the tongue set elastically against the palate, and drawn up behind, see plate A, the furrow is formed of itself. In pronouncing the vowel ah, which must always be mixed with oo and o, oh, it is a good idea to think of yawning. The furrow must be formed in order to allow the breath to resonate against the hard palate beneath the nose. Without the furrow in the tongue, no tone is perfect in its resonance. The only exception is the very highest head and falsetto tones, which, without any palatal resonance and A placement, have their place solely in the head cavities. Strong and yet delicate, it must be able to fit any letter of the alphabet, that is, help form its sound. It must be of the greatest sensitiveness in adapting itself to every tonal vibration. It must assist every change of tone and letter as quick as a flash and with unerring accuracy. Without changing its position too soon or remaining too long in it, in the highest range it must be able almost to speak out in the air. With all its strength and firmness, the tongue must be of the utmost sensitiveness toward the breath, which, as I have often said, must not be subjected to the least pressure above the larynx or in the larynx itself. Pressure must be limited to the abdominal and chest muscles, and this should better be called stress than pressure. Without hindrance, the column of breath, at its upper end like diverging rays of light, must fill and expand all the mucous membranes with its vibrations equally diffuse itself through the resonance chambers, and penetrate the cavities of the head. When the back of the tongue can rise no higher, the larynx must be lowered. This often happens in the highest ranges, and one needs only to mingle an oo in the vowel to be sung, which must, with deep-set larynx, however, be felt not forward in the mouth, but behind the nose. When the larynx must stand very low, the tongue naturally must not be too high, else it would affect the position of the larynx. The mass of the tongue must then be disposed of elsewhere, that is, by the formation of a furrow. See plate. One must learn to feel and hear it. To keep the larynx, the back of the tongue, and the palate always in readiness to offer mutual assistance, must become a habit. As soon as we have the tongue under control, that is, have acquired the habit of forming a furrow, 
we can use it confidently as a support for the breath and the tone, and for vowels. On its incurving back it holds firmly the vowels, with its tip many of the consonants. With all its elasticity it must be trained to great strength and endurance. I, for instance, after every syllable, at once jerk my tongue with tremendous power back to its normal position in singing, that is, with its tip below the front teeth and the base raised. That goes on constantly, as quick as a flash. At the same time, my larynx takes such a position that the tongue cannot interfere with it, that is, press upon it. In the middle range, where the tongue or the larynx might be too high or too low, the furrow, which is of so much importance, is formed, in order to lead the vocalized breath first against the hard palate beneath the nose, then slowly over and along the nose and behind it. Then, when the highest point, the peak, which is extremely extensible, is reached, the pillars of the fauces contract, in order to leave the way for the head tones to the head cavities entirely free. In doing this, the sides of the tongue are raised high. Every tongue should occupy only so much space as it can occupy without being a hindrance to the tone. The bad, bad tongue. One is too thick, another too thin, a third too long, a fourth much too short. Ladies and gentlemen, these are nothing but the excuses of the lazy. End of section 20 Section 21. Preparation for Singing No one can sing properly without first preparing for it, mentally and physically, with all the organs concerned in the production of the voice. We have in this to perform three functions simultaneously. First, to draw breath quietly, not too deeply to force the breath during singing against the chest and hold it there firmly so that we really begin with a nearly sunken in chest and stop with a lifted one. Generally the opposite takes place. See plate the path of the breath. Second, to raise the soft palate at the same time toward the nose so that the breath remains stationary until the singing begins. Third, to jerk the tongue backward at the same time, its back being thus raised and elastic, ready to meet all the wishes of the singer, that is, the needs of the larynx. The larynx must not be pressed either too low or too high, but must work freely. The breath is enabled to stream forth from it like a column whose form is moulded above the larynx by the base of the tongue. When these three functions have been performed, the three vowels A, E, U are placed for the attack. This placement is always the same because it is the foundation of each tone, no matter what the word is we wish to pronounce. Only after this placement for the attack is the word thought placed and sung. Now further care must be given that the point of attack on the palate, that is, the focal point of the breath, be not subjected to pressure, and that the entire supply of breath be not expended upon the palatal resonance. To this end, the palate must remain elastic, for it has a twofold duty to perform. It must not only furnish resistance for the focal point of the breath, except in the very highest head tones, around which it can be diffused. The same resistance, which stands against the stream of breath from below, must also afford a firm, pliant and elastic floor for the overtones, which, soaring above the palate, shift as is needed to or above the hard and soft palate, or are divided in the nose, forehead and head cavities. It can easily be seen how any pressure in singing can be dangerous everywhere, and how careful the singer is forced to be 
to avoid such mistakes. End of section 21